Hello, everybody. This is George N. Hughes, and this is The Bite Show. And you know that laugh. It's Dr. Joseph P. Farrell. Please visit his website, GizaDeathStar.com. He has been running, uh, blogging a very interesting um, article about Kennedy bear bonds. <laughs> and, oh, my goodness, Joseph, that, that is interesting info. Oh, thank you. And be sure you make use of the PayPal button while you're there. It costs money to do research, and especially the kind that Joseph Farrell does. And today we're going to get into genes, giants, monsters, uh, part three. And this is very interesting material. Hmm. Joseph, uh-huh. um, in Cosmic Wars, yes. um, there was a, a hybrid race, uh-huh. and it was reduced to cannibalism, yes. um, uh-huh. where they served up a daughter for meal and right. served up a son for food. Right. Can you expand on that? Uh, yeah, um, th- thanks for having me back, George. <laughs> yeah. And, and thank you for the, for the plug about the website and the donations and everything. I've been writing, uh, I'm writing two books right now. <laughs> yes. so I'm in my juggling routine again, but you mentioned that Ker- Kennedy, um, bearer bonds thing, and I, you know, that was kind of a reminder to me to, to thank everybody that, that has been visiting the website and becoming members and making donations. I truly, truly do appreciate that. Yes. Uh, particularly with this, one of, one of these books is a big project and, uh, I'm hoping to get that one out sometime within the next year and a half. I mean, it's that big of a project. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But um, the Kennedy Bear Bonds, incidentally, that that series of articles, I'm uh, we haven't heard the end of it. I've got a couple more uh, articles scheduled about that, based on some listener comments uh, and some reader comments on the website. So that'll be coming out next week. It seems to be a story that everybody's kind of interested in. So, yeah. You know, I've been kind of steadily commenting. Anyway, back to cannibals. <laughs> yes. Now, now that we've talked about fraudulent bearer bonds, let's go to cannibalism. <laughs> we are very diverse. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're very diverse here on the Bite Show. <laughs> anyway, um, the the reference that you're talking about in um, the Cosmic War, I think it was in Chapter Eight. I mentioned those stories. There, there are stories from from Mesopotamia, and. In particular, this this story, at least in the Mesopotamian version of this story, is that after mankind has been more or less genetically engineered into existence, the that kind of chimerical humanity, according to the Babylonian legends, grows in population so fast. And if you kind of read between the lines of, of those epics a bit, Mankind becomes a threat to the gods, all right? Yeah. And in the Babylonian, Mesopotamian versions of this story, the the gods decide that in order to curb the threat, they're just going to have to do in mankind their own creation. Yeah. So they contrive a, a series of things that they hope will will work and... One of the things that they try, this is one of the attempts that they make before the flood, is to simply starve mankind right out of existence. (laughs) And the result was, in that version of the story, the result was, was that this chimerical humanity began the practice of cannibalism, quite literally. (sighs) And, yeah, uh, the food supply was so low that, that people just started killing and eating each other. Oh dear. Which is which was the the plan. Yeah. But the problem was it wasn't proceeding fast enough. One gets that kind of impression from these texts and, and it wasn't proceeding fast enough, so eventually of course they decide on, on 
let's wipe him out in one fell swoop, and, and that's kind of the, the origin of, of the flood. Oh, my. Yeah, it's, it's you know, the thing here, George Ann, that's very interesting to me is that one has different versions of this story yes. of God or the gods wiping out mankind for whatever reason. And if you compare the stories from around the world, you're you're getting more or less the same sort of impression. There was something uh, there was something about humanity, and I talk about this incidentally a great deal in in the book that will be coming out in a couple of months called The Grid of the Gods, which is kind of a sequel uh, to Gene's Giants, Monsters, and Men. All right. Yeah. Uh, it's also the first book that I've officially co-authored with, with a friend of mine, um, uh, Dr. Scott DeHart from, from the University of Oxford. Um, but if you look at these stories, George Ann, the impression that occurs over and over again, and even though the stories may vary in their details and vary in some of the order in which things are presented, one thing invariably emerges in all of them, and that is that mankind is somehow a threat to the gods. Yes. And this this is particularly true if you if you look at uh, what I like to call the Tower of Babel moment in history, because all cultures have some version of that idea too, although yes. they may not connect it with building of towers and so on and so forth. But, you know, in the biblical version, as we've discussed, <coughs> excuse me, discussed before, the, the motivation for the confusion of tongues isn't anything moral. It's, it's, you know, mankind will be able to do whatever he imagines to do. Yes. So, in other words, there is some sort of implicit threat there. Um, in the Mayan version, it's very clear. So, we're seeing a bit of that again in these Mesopotamian texts, you know, where they're talking about cannibalism, is if you read the context of the story that I mentioned in Cosmic War, mankind is uh mankind simply by dint of, of the growth of the population, the human population, is is perceived to be a threat. So, you know, you've got all sorts of motivations in all these different tellings of this basic story. You've got different motivations and uh, George Ann, I'm coming kind of to the conclusion that we may be looking at a story that is so old yes. that it has been kind of split up and garbled in all the different retellings, and that really we're looking at, in all these cultures and texts, we're looking at different versions, more or less, of the same story. And the reason I say that, and I'll kind of... Uh, pull the lid a little bit back on, on Grid of the Gods as well and how it fits into this Cosmic War, Gene Strands, Monsters, Men scenario is that in the Mayan version of this story you have the, the very definite idea that humanity's knowledge constitutes a threat and that, therefore, mankind has to be, just as in the Tower of Babel version in, in, in uh, the Old Testament, mankind has to be fragmented. He has to be um, broken apart in order to prevent this, this knowledge from being acted upon. So, you know, you've got different tellings, basically, of the same motifs. And, and uh, to me, I think we're looking increasingly, I mean, this is the opinion I'm coming to now. It may change in future research. But the opinion I'm coming to now is that these stories, these texts, are so very, very, very old that they're coming down from high antiquity. And... Um, they've been kind of garbled in the transmission so that, that no one version of it has the exclusive, exhaustive, true version of it. Let's put it that way. Yes. Well, there apparently mankind was very noisy and this agitated the, the big honcho god. <laughs> right. And uh, he said, uh, told the others, you've got to do something about this. Yes, exactly so. Exactly so, and that's that's where the idea of, of starvation comes in. And 
uh, you know, it's it's one of many solutions that they try until someone hits upon the idea, well, let's just flood them out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, drown them like rats. Yeah, drown them oh. like rats. Um, Gee. So, in other words, you know, the the... The telling of the story in most versions, not all of them, but in most versions, the telling of the story isn't connected to any uh, superior morality of God or the gods. It's it's a totally political story. In other words, mankind is a threat, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, using the modern 20th century approach, you know, well, let's bomb them into the Stone Age. <laughs> <You know? Jeez. laughs> Had they had those kinds of, uh, had they had those kinds of technological references to tell their myths back in, they probably would have said that too. You know. Oh my gosh. Ah, uh, well, we've got extraordinary longevity of the yes. gods, and I remember reading uh, King's List. Yes. Um, some yes. time ago. The Sumerian King's List, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. And. The lifespans are extraordinary. Yes, they're extraordinarily long. Uh, tens of thousands, if not uh, in one or two cases, if I recall. I may be mistaken. So, you know, don't everybody jump on my bandwagon. I can't remember details. <laughs> but, you know, t at least tens of thousands of years long in, in some cases. And uh, there's one or two instances that are very, very long indeed. But uh, one of the things that... I sort of tickle this idea in Genes, Giants, Monsters, and Men, if I can anticipate your question, is that if we are looking, you know, if we assume the argument that we're looking at a sophisticated civilization in ancient times, and we're not only looking at a sophisticated physics, we're not only looking at a sophisticated philosophical cosmology or religion, if you will, but we're also looking at a sophisticated genetic science. And if that be the case, then it is possible that they may have figured out some way genetically to prolong human life. And the testament of that, I think, is if you, you know, anybody listening to this show tonight can go online, George Ann, and, and do searches for the different kinds of therapies that scientists are now thinking about in order to prolong human life. Yeah, they're mostly genetic. They're mostly genetic in nature. Yeah. There are a few that are based in, in nanotechnology and so on, and, and yeah. there are even combinations of the two, combinations of genetics and, and nanotechnology. And there are, there are geneticists that have, have commented that, you know, genetically the human genome looks like it was designed to live at least 120 years, you know, which yeah. is way beyond our, our current average lifespan. So, you know, this is this is something that has puzzled geneticists as well, is why do we turn off so early? So it's conceivable to my mind that if you grant all the, the previous propositions, that those long lifespans may not be entirely figments of, of the Mesopotamian science fiction imagination, <laughs> as it were. Because again, you know, you find you find uh, long lifespans in in the Old Testament. You find long lifespans again in the Egyptian version of, of the King's List by by Manetho. So it's it's not something peculiar just to the Bible or just to Mesopotamia. You find it in Egypt, and you find allusions to it in in the legends of other cultures as well. So it's something that, uh, again, I don't think these people are coming up with this, George Ann, entirely out of their imagination. Yes. I think you know. Again, we're looking at fragments of a story that each culture has passed down in its own different way but but the basic conception is the same at one time mankind lived a lot longer and it may have been the result of an advanced science and and let me look, let me say one more thing because this is a very important point oh say dozens of more things <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> Well, I'll try. This is very interesting. <laughs> well, you know, 
as I mentioned before, the the and and this came out as I was researching uh, Grid of the Gods, and, and then as um, my co-author uh, Scott and I were, were researching, uh, or pardon me, as I was researching Genes, Giants, Monsters, and Men, and then my co-author Scott and I researching Grid of the Gods, is that you have this idea that mankind after, you know, in these stories, after he's engineered into existence. And again, we're assuming them to be true, you know, yeah. for, the, for the sake of argument. We're assuming these stories are, to some degree, true for the sake of argument. Yeah. Well, these stories more or less make it clear, as I've said, that mankind knew too much, that he posed some sort of threat with his knowledge. And this is an idea that I mentioned way, way, way back in the very first book I ever wrote in, in all of this alternative uh, research series, The Giza Death Star. Because at the very end of that book, I pointed out that if you have a humanity that is living an extraordinarily long time, the knowledge that that humanity will acquire will grow exponentially. Imagine, if you will, for a moment, a an Albert Einstein not living less than a hundred years, but perhaps for a thousand. Yes. Imagine the accomplishments that minds like that would have oh, yes. in terms of their lifespan. So now, if you if you consider an entire human population that lives a long time, it's very conceivable that you would have a a civilization, a society that's quite literally composed of a bunch of Renaissance men, a, a bunch of Leonardo da Vinci's, you know, that are yeah. able to think in a detailed fashion across several disciplines and do so, and moreover, in a form or in a fashion that's very highly integrated, that's very interdisciplinary. So in other words, it is conceivable with those long lifespans that knowledge itself grew very, very fast and did not have to be recycled as we have to do now every 70 years. Yes. So in other words, this is the other component, I think, if you if you sift through all of these stories that, that I've mentioned in Cosmic War, that I've mentioned in Genes, Giants, Monsters, and Men, uh, other stories that I've added to, to the mix in, in The Grid of the Gods, is that if mankind's knowledge is a threat, then one way you can deal with the threat that that imposes or that that implies is to shorten humanity's lifespan dramatically uh -huh. so that yeah you see whatever you see where i'm going yeah. so that you have to that humanity quite literally has to recycle its sum total of knowledge within a very short period of time you know an average generation now is 70 years so this means we're having to recycle the entire deposit of human knowledge about every 20 years Oh my! So, in other words, the 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 handing down of knowledge and the progress of knowledge slows a great deal. So, you know, you look at you look at the progress of human knowledge and science w within the last several thousand years to the beginning of some of these ancient high civilizations, and you realize that knowledge really only begins to take off in in a kind of a geometric progression beginning with the european enlightenment and and then continuing into the 19th century with with the industrial revolution and so on so you know we've only recently in my opinion george ann gotten back to a state of knowledge where we're beginning to reacquire that ancient sophistication what we're lacking that they had and this is a very important point, and and I'm I'm planning to touch on this in a future book in a major way, because it's a very very, uh, it's a very very disconcerting and disturbing image. You are so titillating. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the the future book where I'm planning to touch on this is is again a book I'm I'm co-author co-authoring with my friend Scott DeHart, but. Um, the the return to that high state of civilization for those who invest the time to study these ancient texts and 
view them from the standpoint of possibly containing clues to a hidden science, a lost science, a lost technology, a lost state of, of human culture. Yes. If you view these texts in that way, then it will have occurred to these people now in modern times that for humanity to return to that state of existence requires that we recover that ancient longevity. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. So this means that you can view all of these recent scientific pronouncements about the possibilities of genetic therapies or of nanotechnology therapies or combinations of the two, plus a lot of other therapies that are out there that I think will, will gradually begin to enter the, the public domain that have been private for a very long time. I think that the possibility emerges that science has been following a, uh, how to put it, a, a hidden agenda, not only to recreate the, the chimerical creatures of the past, but to recreate the states of longevity of the past. I think, I think science is busily engaged in trying to bring these ancient mythologies back to life. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a big statement. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> because because it implies, you see, that there was a hidden purpose behind the development of science itself, and that's and you know that's that's quite a whopper yes. to say. But nonetheless, I think it's a I think it's a possibility that emerges. You know that you have to entertain once you start looking at things from the standpoint of this really huge, big picture that I've been trying to, with I don't know whatever success <laughs> I've had in picturing it. But um, when you view that big picture in that way, I think you have to look very carefully at the origins of science historically, the people behind it, and what their motivations really were. Yes. Uh, you know, I can I can name several people that, that your listeners would be familiar with that have very peculiar esoteric connections. Sir Isaac Newton, uh, Robert Boyle, uh, Paracelsus, and so on and so forth. All of these men were, were known in their time as great scientists, and even Galileo had his own weird little associations with, with esoteric uh, doctrines. So, you know, we have to look again, I think, very carefully at the possibility that maybe this was the elaboration of a technique that was deliberately being put into place to bring about a restoration of these, these ancient ideas and, and technologies. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a whopper. Yeah, it is. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it is. You know, that's that's not something you, that's not something you would hear any university professor of the history of science ever say. <laughs> so, oh, no. so you know, I'm 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 again crawling way out on a on a limb of high speculation. <laughs> yes, and and the limb, quite frankly, may not be strong enough to support the weight of the speculation that I'm placing on it. <laughs> oh, my goodness, Joseph. Well, in the Enuma Elish yes, uh -huh. creation epic and the Atrahasis yeah, uh -huh. epic, they speak of chimerical creatures yes. of which man was one. Yes. Um, we commonly think of... We, we would never think of man as being a chimerical creature. No, uh, right. Only uh, goats with black widow spider genes and things right. like that as being, right. you know. Um, it, it, can you amplify on that? Well, I'm not sure um, how to amplify. Um let, let me let me begin by saying that that I do not regard the Enuma Elish as a creation epic. Um, the that that view of that ancient Mesopotamian text is largely the view that is held in universities in the in the academy. 
my personal view has never been that the text reads that way. This is a view, I think, that is imposed upon the text uh, by academics to to make it say some metaphysical things when it's really not talking about metaphysical things at all. It's talking quite literally about a cosmic war and, and gives you abundant uh, references in the text that describe a very sophisticated physics and, and weapon that's being used. And in the process of doing so, it talks about the creation of chimerical creatures by one side in this war precisely as weapons. All right? Okay. Now, the reason I find that fascinating, George Ann, and, and to this day I still do, is that the the idea of the creation of a chimerical creature as a weapon has been voiced within genetics, within certain circles within genetics, ever since scientists began to realize that that particular science would eventually lead to techniques that would allow them to create chimerical creatures. Yes. So they have... You know, again, you can go online and dig and, and sniff and scratch around and eventually come on to uh, places where you will see talk about the engineering of chimerical creatures of, for specific purposes and uses in warfare. Yes. So, again, uh, it's looking to me very much... When you, when you put together the things I, I said in Cosmic War with the things I said in, in Gene's Giants, Monsters, Men, uh, in the things that, that my co-author and I say in, in Grid of the Gods that will be coming out, if you look at this picture that way, it once again appears to me that science, at least in some circles, is being deliberately conceived as a means of recreating that civilization in all of its aspects. Oh. Yeah, that's, again, that's that's a whopper. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, I, I, in fact, that, George Ann, I'll be very blunt and honest, that whole idea of a kind of uh, an apocalyptic science, of, of a science deliberately conceived and and driven by a motivation to recreate that ancient high civilization is in itself, I'm discovering, such a huge subject. Oh yes. That it it, it is going to require uh books on that topic alone and I, and I've already kind of projected a series on, on various Ideas contained within that that kind of concept because um, I, I'm running into uh, all sorts of things in in this research that uh, my co-author and I are conducting now that are simply going to require that that our original concepts be split among several books. So yeah, this this is a huge uh, trust me here, folks. This, <laughs> this is. This is an absolutely huge area of, of research. And um, in my opinion, I don't think it's ever really been adequately looked into by anybody. Of much course less, not. Well, much less, oh. much less um, speculated on yes. adequately. Much less researched from the standpoint of connecting particular dots in a particular way, which I'm not going to go into. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, that was that was a bad that was a bad way to end a, a long section of talk. But <laughs> unfortunately, I just can't do it right now. Well, how was it that man was looked at as a chimerical creature? Well, I mean that that emerges rather obviously from from the texts that refer to mankind or that indicate that mankind was a sort of chimerical offspring of, of the gods and, and whatever uh, proto-humanity they may have found here. Um, this, in my opinion, and again, you get many, many 
uh, scholars of a traditional mind that that dispute the whole idea. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm saying all of this. You know, let's look at this for the sake of argument. What does this mean if it's true? Yes. Um, I certainly don't object to those who say, well, these texts don't mean that at all. All right, uh-huh. you know, because because we have to be honest with everybody, George Ann. Uh, everybody is entitled to look at these texts from the best light that they have and possess. Yes. Uh, I'm certainly not saying that this way is the only way or the best way to do so. I'm simply saying let's look at them this way and figure out then from from that point of view what the implications are. And if you do that, then the implication is, number one, that mankind, yes, is is a deliberately engineered chimerical being and most of these texts and and what makes me give them credence is the fact that you have more or less the same version of the story in Mesopotamia and Mesoamerica all right Mm -hmm. and you can't have the same version of the story half a world and an ocean away by two entirely unrelated cultures unless there had been some sort of contact between the two. In other words, a a common tradition passed down and then differently understood and garbled by each of those cultures. In other words, one is an interesting story. Two's a coincidence. But three versions of the same story, then I think you have to sit up and take notice that there's a possibility that this story is true. Yes. All right? In those stories, mankind is a genetically engineered creature. And again, most of these stories go back to the idea that mankind was engineered too much like the gods Uh and knew too much and posed a threat to the gods and therefore had to be dealt with either by elimination or by breaking him up in some fashion or another uh this this is over and over again what you find and encounter in these texts oh. it's a, yeah it, it it is it is um it, it is a huge story george and and disturbing that, well it, of course it's disturbing because it means something very significant about ourselves yes that if these things are true, then then there is something about ourselves that we don't know that is very powerful. Oh, yes. You see, and uh, if that's the case, then it stands to reason there are going to be those who don't want us to find it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's the other aspect of this story. That's why I, I've couched these books, including Jane Giants, Monsters, and Men, as part of the telling of the story of the activity of those post-cosmic war elites. What were they doing? What were they up to? Why were they up to it? And I think that it is clear from some of the little details I've alluded to in that series of books, you know, Babylon's Banksters, The Philosopher's Stone, Gene Giant's Monster's Man, Grid of the Gods that's coming out, when you connect the dots between these books, one set of dots leads me to the very tentative conclusion that at least one of these elites that survived that war does not want mankind to figure this out. Yes. <laughs> and that another elite or elites do want mankind to figure this out. So there's a, in my view, a tremendous struggle throughout history uh, between these two points of view. And, you know, we can call them the good guys or the bad guys. Um, we can we can try and moralize about their motivations. Would one group be off-worlder, worlders? They could the, be, yes. And the other group uh, based on the planet? They could be, yes, but but I tend more to the view that both groups have an on and an off planet 
component. Oh. Yeah, I tend to that view. Um, I, I just, as a matter of fact, I posted a little uh, members-only white paper on my website just today that talks about some aspects of this problem, not not specifically with regard to who's on planet and who's off planet, but with regard to other other problems implied by this notion that that there's some sort of uh, hidden elite or elites that's been very active throughout history. Um, because it is, you know, it is simply a model that I'm assuming is true for the sake of being able to interpret the text. It may or may not be true in and of itself, but thus far it has worked as a model by which to to look at these texts and look at these activities and make some sort of sense of them. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Again, it's it's a huge. Uh, it's a huge program because if it is true, then this means that there has been a very long term agenda. Yes. Stemming from, from high antiquity to the present time. And again, I want to stress very clearly what should be obvious to anybody listening to this that you will not find any university professor anywhere willing to crawl out way to the end of that limb on the tree all the way to the tiniest little twig on the end of it. Uh, that's literally what I'm doing here. Um, if you assume that, that uh, very long-term agenda from high antiquity, yes. then, yeah, it does focus certain aspects of history and, and activities throughout history into a very interesting picture. But again, I stress change your perspective just a few degrees to the left or right of that picture and it could change completely. Mm. Well, that kind of brings up another issue. Uh -huh. the, the <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. That's what we're here for. <laughs> the ownership of uh -huh. the earth. Yes. Yeah. This is something I do get into, uh, and, and I think we mentioned it either in the first or the second one of these uh, Gene's Giants series, is that I spent a great deal of time, George Ann, in this last book discussing the idea of mankind being property. Yes. And again, it's a question that arises when you juxtapose the events surrounding the modern genome project and the technologies that have spun off from it, when you juxtapose those things with these ancient stories. Because in modern American patent law, you can patent a gene. You can patent a synthetic life form. You can patent even a chimerical life form. Yes. Yeah. Because in patent law, something is eligible for a patent if, first of all, it does not arise in the natural order, and secondly, requires the hand of man to arise at all, and thirdly, if in that process you can reproduce it. In other words, anyone sitting down and reading your patent should be able to reproduce the process with the same results. It's like a recipe. All right. If all that be the case, then if you go back and just oppose those requirements upon the ancient stories, then you'll discover that these ancient stories fulfill the legal requirements for a patent and therefore for property. Now, what's really interesting and peculiar is that in those ancient stories, be it stories from Mesopotamia to Mesoamerica, as I discuss in The Grid of the Gods, if you look at those ancient stories, then one of the things that clearly emerges is the attitude of these so-called gods to their engineered creation, mankind. Yeah. Because they have the attitude that mankind is essentially 
a slave to them. He's yes. created to serve their needs, serve their whims, uh, to exist in a state of servitude, and in many cases to, to perform worship for these gods. It sounds right? like a bunch of politicians. Yeah, it, well, exactly. You know, um, and that and that is a telling comparison because you know this idea of servitude, of serfdom, of slavery, of of a, a legal requirement yeah. to perform worship of these of these gods. Um, that whole idea again connotes the idea that mankind is property. Uh-huh. So yeah, you've you've got a whole lot of implications that spin out of this kind of analysis of of ancient text, you know, juxtaposing modern technologies and then using that as a way of interpreting what the ancient texts say. And again, I'm not saying that this is absolutely true. I'm saying if you examine it for the sake of argument, this is what emerges and it is therefore a possibility that we might have to contend with it if these stories are true. Oh. It's very, very complex, and it's very, very uh, dangerous, because obviously these themes of, of servitude, of uh, some sort of legal and, and uh, moral obligation to the gods is well, a theme the, uh, very look, prevalent in religion. Look at the IRS. <laughs> yeah, well, you exactly. Know, you know, uh, you've got you've got all of these notions yes. that are there in these texts, and they have profound, they have huge, they have enormous implications for some of the standard institutions of of major religions. Yes, and and some of their uh, tenets. <clears throat> so you know, again, this is this is why I'm. I'm putting all this out there is to to get people to think about these things and to think uh, how to put it, to think outside of whatever system they've commonly accepted to, to yeah. challenge received notions because let's 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 give a hypothetical. If those people, if those genetic cousins of ours should ever show back up and demand their due bill for their property. Yeah. What are we going to do? No. How are we going to argue? Mm. What What would all principles of law say in that case? And there are principles, incidentally, in law that would argue very persuasively that no, we are no longer property. Yeah. There are very there are quite a few principles in law that would argue that. Wow. Because, again, you have another thing that emerges from all of these scenarios that I've discussed in these various books, and that is that at some point the gods are either kicked off of this planet or banished from it or what have you, and thus you have a case of abandoned property. Yes. <laughs> so, you see, this, this, gets, <laughs> this gets very, very thorny. Oh, my gosh. Jim. Yeah, oh, my gosh. <laughs> this is huge. <laughs> yeah, it, of course it's huge. This is a huge story. But the hugeness, Georgian, this is this is a really crucial point that you bring up here. The hugeness of this story is in those ancient texts themselves. Yes. The story that they contain is a huge story. And when I say ancient texts, I'm talking about everything from the the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Puranas, the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, to to the Enuma Elish, the Atrahasis in Mesopotamia, to you know the the ancient Egyptian Edfu text, to the Popol Vuh of the Maya, to ancient Japanese. You know, I'm talking about all of that. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm not. One thing that people have to understand is I am not setting up any textual tradition or any cultural version of these stories as the canon by which I measure the others. Yeah. I'm letting them all speak more or less equally and trying to figure out on the basis of our contemporary state of knowledge if the sum total of these ancient texts is true. And, of course, once you... Once you uh, once you put things into that 
way of viewing them, then yes, certain texts emerge as containing more accurate descriptions of this modern technology than others. So I'm the 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 other thing I want people to understand is even though I'm not making a particular cultural or textual tradition a canon by which to measure the others, I am not saying, by the same token, that all texts are of equal weight or merit in telling this story. Yes. But I think that has to be adjudged by a very, very careful sifting of the text, and I'll be very blunt and honest here. My way of doing so is no more has no more probability or any less probability, I don't think, than anybody else's way of doing so. Uh, this this is not a field of research that, in my opinion, anybody can afford to be dogmatic about. <clears throat> mm. Wow! And 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 it's, it's yeah. It's it's the, and the reason why they can't be dogmatic, Jordan, is simply because this is too huge of a story. Yes. In my opinion, for any one author, myself or anybody else to put together with exhaustive completeness and truth. Yes. So, you know, I want everybody to bear that in mind. Well, do you think that Genesis 2 was heavily edited? I th- Well, yeah, I think all of these texts back then were heavily edited. But, yes, I, you know, I take... Um, I take essentially a, a highly modified um, critical view. In other words, yeah. the critics that, that <clears throat> came up with with the documentary hypothesis that I talk about a great deal in, in the first chapter of Gene's Giants, as a matter of fact. Um, I do take the view that, that the Old Testament text, uh, beginning to end, is one of the most highly edited texts uh, among all these collections in the world, um, you know, and and for a variety of reasons. Well, it seems uh, to serve an agenda. Well, again, they all serve an agenda. Yes. That's the problem, and that's why I take the approach that it's very, very hazardous to this type of research to make any one uh, version of these stories the version by which you measure and weigh the merits of the others. Yes. Um, and again, you know, that people are people are certainly entitled to take the other point of view. They are certainly entitled to take a particular textual tradition and measure others in terms of it. I just myself don't think that you're going to get very far doing that. Oh. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and and the reason again is <clears throat> because it's a huge story. It is. It's <laughs> almost all encompassing. It is. Yeah. It is. It is an all encompassing mythology. Mm. It's an all encompassing cosmology. When you get right down to it. Yes. And each culture is understanding this in a particular way, and there's your agenda. Yeah. Because, you know, let's just take the case of the Old Testament versus the the myths of, of Mesopotamia or Egypt between which the Hebrews move. Well, in the standard view of the Old Testament, of course, you have a very monotheistic culture versus polytheistic ones. Yeah. Uh, that view has been very recently and, and uh, strongly challenged by certain scholars that, that maintain that there's actually a, a polytheism in the Old Testament as well. And I think that there actually is an argument to be made for that. So, again, you have to be very, very careful. Um, I think y- you raise an important question when you ask about editing. But my view is and the reason why I take the approach that I do is precisely because we have to be able to get the broad outlines of this story down Yes. before we can engage in the process of trying to figure out 
in detail how each particular version of the story has been edited. Oh, yes. In other words, I don't think anybody is in a position to talk about editing of a text before this total story gets nailed down. And, I, you know, that's, that's kind of a nice euphemistic way of saying wait for about 50 or 200 years before we start talking about editing and agendas behind the editing mm. because we haven't done enough of the basic preliminary spade work to begin with. Yes. Well, I know many of these tablets uh, are locked away in dusty yes. boxes in the yes. basement of the British Museum. Yes. Uh, hundreds of thousands of and them. And the University of Pennsylvania, yeah. you know, on and on we could go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they will <laughs> probably never be looked at. Okay. Well, this is the other, you're, you're exactly right. There is so much that has not been translated in a form readily accessible to the public and there's yeah. so much that hasn't been translated period that we're missing details you know well and is this intentional joseph i think to some extent it is <laughs> um and the reason why is again what has been translated in my opinion has been overlaid with an academic model of interpreting those texts so that people miss, yes. in my opinion, the technological clues. Yes, I agree. Um, so, yeah, I do think a certain amount of it uh, could be written down to, to having been deliberate. Um, and also to maintain the status quo. And to maintain the status quo, precisely, precisely. Oh, gee. Again, it's that problem of human knowledge. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I think a lot of this is uh, a lot of this is a case of perception management. Fortunately, there are uh, scholars of, of the Rig Vedas. There are scholars of, of um, Plato's dialogues, which are shot through with with all sorts of mathematical codes that are just mind-boggling in, in their scope and, and sophistication. Uh, there are people doing this sort of research. Uh, the problem is pulling it all together and, and putting it out there in a form that's accessible to the public that, that they can digest. And, and that really is what I'm attempting to do with, with Genes, Giants, Monsters, and Men. I'm, I'm, I'm acting in that book more as a reporter than yes. um, a speculator. Um, yeah. The, the real speculation comes along in, in Grid of the Gods, which, again, contains a lot of reporting, too. So. Oh. Well, for example, um, we talk about giants and things like that. Well, the tabernacle, the design of the furnishings are for a very, very, very large person. Yes. Much larger than the typical Hebrew. Oh yes, you're right, right. Mm. Right. And again, you know, that's that's one of the chapters in, in Gene Giants where, where I report on the research of, of some people that examined that whole thing from that perspective. Yes. Um, which I think again, I you know, that this puts me at odds with many scholars who just, you know, quote unquote do not want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> but um I think one has to go there if one is going to deal with the broad philosophical issues that it implies, which for me, again, are the central issues. Um, the, the idea that we accept the possibility for the sake of argument that there were advanced technologies in play well, if that is the case, then you cannot select one text and isolate it from the others that you're subjecting that kind of analysis to. Right. And that, again, is, is why I take the approach of, of not making any particular tradition a measure of the others. Um, once you do that, you are, in my opinion, you are subjecting yourself to a kind of perception management 
that those texts themselves want you to have, and therefore you're not going to look in a certain way at certain things. Wow. So again, you know, it's it's uh, it's a very very different approach. I'll grant you. Yes. Well. And they both have their dangers. Let's be honest. They both have their implicit dangers. Oh yeah. Well, genomores, mm-hmm. the genome, the book of life, uh-huh. um, Vintner. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Talk to us about Vintner. Well, Craig Vintner. The reason I mentioned him in Genes, Giants, Monsters, and Men is that Craig Vintner was the more or less the the genius, and and let's credit the man for that, because he he is a a brilliant man, that wanted to crack the decoding of of the human genome, not through the public human genome project, but through a private corporation which he established for the purpose, called called Valera. Yeah. And Ventner, of course, has been one of the, the geneticists Involved with genetic engineering, uh, chimerical creatures, and patenting, and so on and so forth. And it was Ventner and his corporation, in fact, that <clears throat> that really got the the patent ball game for engineered life going. Mm-hmm. So I used him as kind of the entryway to explore the whole question of of patenting of uh, synthetic genomes of, of synthetic chromosomes and yeah. so on and so forth, and then use that as a foil to go back and, and look again at, at the issue of, of these ancient texts and what they were implying. So Ventner, to, to put him into context, Ventner then is a key part of this story because he has, by his actions, he has raised the hypothetical possibility that I examine in the book, that when we apply the same standards of law to these ancient texts, what do we get? Well, we get the idea that mankind under those standards of law and those ancient texts is a patentable object, if those ancient texts are true. Oh, boy. And if patentable, therefore, property. Ah. What were the Bermuda Accords? The Bermuda Accords, oh boy. <laughs> the Bermuda Accords were a set of accords that were agreed upon by people involved around the world in the Human Genome Project. And we have to remember that the Human Genome Project was an enormous, enormous project. It it had the same scale in terms of the amount of money invested, in terms of the amount of uh, people invested in terms of the amount of universities that were involved in this or that aspect of, of research, it had the same scale as as the Manhattan Project, if not if not larger, Whoa. because the the human genome is an extraordinarily complex object, and to map it uh, requires quite literally required supercomputers and extremely sophisticated computer algorithms. Well, the the Bermuda Accords were worked out as a component of of the public genome project to lay down, for want of a better expression, to lay down the ethical guidelines and research guidelines that everybody involved in the project agreed to. And part of those accords stated that all findings of the genome project would be made publicly available. And so, of course, that greatly simplified uh, Craig Ventner's research because, you know, his was a private research project and therefore he was under no obligation to publish any of his results. He did, you know, uh, to his credit, he did. But what what it meant was he could rely on the results and data of the human genome project, the public project, as a foundation for his own research. So, in other words, what happened in the, gene, the in the modern genome war is you had essentially a competition between the public sector, the, the human genome project proper, and then 
Ventner's private enterprise, which was attempting to do the same thing. So it was really a race. And as I get into in the book, it had to be brokered into a tie yeah. <laughs> by the Clinton administration. Oh. So, uh, you know, and I remember that very well uh, when when uh, President Clinton was still in office, that he had the, the big uh, conference there at the White House where... Uh, the the head of the the public genome project and then and then of course Ventner the head of the private one were basically invited to this ceremony that basically said okay boys you both tied oh boy <laughs> it's, it's quite an interesting story in and of itself oh what about um the pillar of cloud uh-huh. Mount Horeb um could this have been a type of microwave? Well, um, I don't get into detailed discussions of what technology that might possibly have been. Okay. Um, personally, I doubt very much that it was a microwave simply because it was invisible. But I do think again, that you have to look at all of those stories. If, you, if you're if you admitting the possibility for the sake of argument that there's technologies in play that are being talked about in these texts, yeah. then you certainly have to look at the biblical stories in that fashion as well. You can't exclude them from that process of analysis. And when you look at things in that fashion, yes, it does appear that there are allusions, again, to technological devices and, moreover, to techniques um, of, of uh, social engineering. So, yeah, I think, you know, I lay all that out in in, um, in the third chapter of Gene Shine's Monsters and Men. And, again, I'm reporting the research of others rather than so much commenting myself as to whether or not I think the research is valid or not. I think it's valid enough that it should be reported and people allowed to make up their own minds yeah. as to what the implications of that for them personally may be. Yeah. Well, Joseph, is it fairly plain that Angels are Anunnaki. No, I don't think it is. And I mean, what what would be the difference? Well, the problem here is again, that is an excellent question, and it's so complicated to answer or even to attempt to answer adequately. We have lots of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to try. I mean, okay. no, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm not going to try. It's just I have to set this up very carefully. Okay. In most traditional Jewish and Christian and even, for that matter, Islamic teaching, angels, or as, as uh, the Muslims call them, jinns, are incorporeal forms of life. Yes. All right. The Anunnaki, on the other hand, if you read the various Mesopotamian texts that talk about them, are very clearly some sort of physical creatures. Yes. All right. And... From the standpoint of, of just pure hypothetical speculation, I don't have any opposition to the idea of incorporeal life forms. Right. Right? right. So I think that that's the first problem you have. This is this is why you cannot uh, simply cram the Bible into a Sumerian or Babylonian or Assyrian or Akkadian context out of which the Bible you know, results as the obscured version of it. Yeah. All right? But by the same token, I don't think you can cram those other texts into the biblical context either. So in other words, I think at this stage of the game of, of research in trying to reconstruct this story, that you cannot sit down and simply say, well, Anunnaki equals angels, because... The, the traditions concerning those two groups of, of life forms are very, very different. They may end up 
being so as research in this field progresses. But again, I think we're about 50 to 100 years away from that uh, ability to be able to identify the two. This is one of this is one of my biggest problems with the the thought and research of Zechariah Sitchin because while he uncovered a massive amount of details, I think that uh, he may have been too ready. And I, I'm, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on the man. I think he did a great deal of good for this field of research simply by exposing interpretive possibilities. All right? yes. But by the same token, I think he, he leapt too quickly in his attempt to identify this God in this pantheon with that God in that pantheon, which you can certainly do. You can make argued cases for all of those identifications, but you have to be careful. Uh, and by the same token, I think that there was a certain uh, rush to identify the Anunnaki of, of Mesopotamian texts with, with the Nephilim of, of Genesis 6 and, and with the sons of God, the, the Bnei Elohim, uh, that are referred to in Genesis 6. So, you know, I think we have to be a little bit more cautious in, in making identifications like that. Oh. Well, what is the difference? I mean... Well, the difference, very bluntly and, and very simply, is, again, that in in the traditional teaching or interpretations of, of those religions, angels are incorporeal beings, and Anunnaki are not. The, the one thing that would indicate a possibility of identification there is, is the reference to the fact in, in uh, Genesis chapter 6 that, that these sons of God or B'nai Elohim uh, sire children with human mothers. Yes. So, you know, how does an incorporeal being do that? Well, that's an indicator that they might in fact be corporeal. But... We have to remember that within the elaboration of, of the doctrine of angels within Judaism and more particularly within Christianity, the idea was always present that these were incorporeal beings that could assume at will a physical manifestation. Kind of like shapeshifters. Yeah, kind of like shapeshifters, right. Yeah. So again, um, I think we have to be cautious in making identifications like that. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, oh, gosh. Why, Joseph, why did the gods decide that they should slaughter one of their own? Well, that's that's a text that I mentioned first in, um, I believe it was Cosmic War in, in the 8th chapter. Do you know that series that we did on Cosmic War is still being heavily downloaded? <laughs> <laughs> My word. And we did that we did that two or three years ago. Yes. Well, in a way it's not surprising, George Ann, because in a way that particular book, as I've said over and over again, is really the keystone in the arch of all the other books, including the Nazi books. Um it's that book that I, I basically lay out the, the alternative interpretation of, of some of these ancient texts, that, you know, this war was real. Yeah. And that we're not looking at metaphors of, of meteors hitting the Earth or hitting a planet in the asteroid belt and blowing it up and all of this nonsense. Right. Um, um, and I think that there is enough by way of, of clues in the solar system that would tend to support that hypothesis. But, so, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me that, that people are gravitating to that particular series because that is the book that that I deliberately intended to kind of tie all the others together. Yeah. Um, but... I forgot your original question. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> you know me. I <laughs> running around Harvey's barn again, as my mom would say. About the slaughtering of oh, the slaughter. Of, yes. Yeah. Well, in in the standard way that that text is interpreted academically, and and I reproduce um, 
the academic translation of that text in the Cosmic War. Mm-hmm. When mankind is about to be engineered, the gods decide, well, in order for us to do this, we're going to have to slaughter one of our own. That's the way the translation is made. Um, in Genes, Giants, Monsters, and Men, I point out that there is a possibility of an alternative translation there that slaughtering wasn't at all what they were doing. So it depends, again, on whether or not you want to follow a standard academic model of translating these texts or if you want to follow a a model of translation that's very, very different that, that some other researchers have come up with. If you select the first, obviously you're dealing with a moral implication here because that means that these gods really aren't all that very moral. Yeah. You know, that they're willing to slaughter one of their own just to create a slave species to give them service and worship. (laughs) On the other view, then the the morality changes and the technology changes. This is why I think it's very important for people to have access to more than one version of the story, be it academic or non-academic. Right. I think you know. I think it's very important for people to understand that scholars are every bit as capable as of, as anyone else of manipulating a text according to their agenda. Yeah. So you know that uh, that may upset a lot of scholars, but you know, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Well, it just seems... And by the same token, so are alternative researchers. You know, that's the other point to be remembered here. They can manipulate texts to suit their agenda. So, you know, it's it's important for people to realize that there are two versions of details of this big story. Mm. What is reverse depattering? Depatterning? Yeah. I refer to that in... in um, the third chapter of Genes Giants in connection to the elaboration of modern techniques of, of and, and please understand technique, not technology, but technique of mind manipulation. It was a technique invented by a CIA psychologist by the name of Evan Cameron who was involved with their MK Ultra mind manipulation project. And essentially what it involved was... <laughs> a lot of sleep deprivation and then alternating that with a lot of uh, sleep induction. In other words, putting people to sleep through drug cocktails and making them sleep very long times. And the result was to create essentially a a kind of a mental tabula rasa uh, to then be able to imprint what were considered proper models or activities of of normal social behavior. And and this man uh, literally tried these techniques on on people suffering from schizophrenia, basically to to, uh, essentially to wipe out both personalities and and implant a new one. Mm. Yeah, and it was was to a certain degree successful. But... uh, In the process, when you read the descriptions that I put in Gene's Giants of of what he was doing, uh, it was nothing less, in my opinion, it was nothing less than than a form of of, uh, psychological and emotional and mental torture. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. They do a lot of that under the guise of research, torture. Yes, uh, yes, they do. They do. There's no doubt about this. And they have unwitting victims, you know, locked up in institutions. Yes. Um, that they do this on. Uh, yes. With telling if there is a family on the outside, telling them that, well, we're going to try this treatment. Yes. Uh, how sick. It's just terrible. Well, it is. And... and the real problem, George Ann, and I don't even get into this in yeah. the book, but the real problem is the degree to which the the professions of psychiatry and psychology were used by intelligence agencies in these programs of, of uh, research on mind manipulation. Um, 
that to me is is a horrific part of the story and and you know there's there have been researchers that have written about that yes but uh it's I, personally i think that research into that subject needs to be updated quite a bit um, mm-hmm. because most of most of the standard sources now that you can think of in that regard uh, the mind manipulators by shefflin and and uh the Manchurian Candidate by Marx and, and the Zapping of America and so on. All of these, all of these works that are considered standards in the field, well, they're about 20 to 30 years out of date. Yeah. So that whole that whole subject needs to be updated uh, thoroughly and and uh, by some responsible researchers. Um, because I'm I'm with you. I think this is probably something that has uh, research that has continued. Well, look at what happens to men in prison. Uh, well, to anyone in prison, and and to anyone with uh, that's been in in mental institutions or on yeah. some of these things. Um, I, I think there's I think there's still a huge story there. Oh yes, there is. Well, back to the gods. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were near open revolt yes. because. Uh, they figured that the work they had to do, was, the physical work, was too hard. Well, yeah, the the story in the Mesopotamian version is is again that that mankind was created as as basically a workforce, uh, yeah, you know, as slaves to tend and care for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, the in those versions of the story. The and the Mayan version is slightly different in, in some key subtle details, but in those versions of this story, the gods apparently are not in sufficient numbers to carry out whatever project it is that they're working on. And of course, you know, uh, Sitchin has his own whole scenario about what it is they're doing, um, yeah. and I, I'm certainly not a subscriber to, to his whole scenario. Um, but nonetheless, they're engaged in some sort of project that is beyond their physical means, and that's why they're complaining. And that's eventually, if you read the story, is why they decide to, to create a slave that's intelligent enough to do the work without too much supervision and so on and so forth. So, uh, yeah, it's, this, is, this is yet another component of the story, which, again, if true, has certain implications. Well, I would... Uh bet money on if I had any <laughs> that it is true well that obviously that's my inclination yeah uh, I wouldn't be writing these things if I didn't think that there was a case here to be looked at rather carefully um, you know that's certainly my my inclination so I think that <coughs> pardon me I think that if we Again, if we take these stories seriously for the sake of argument, it's really the implications of these stories that that we have to bear in mind. Well, if this is true, then then what does this mean for uh, humanity, for morality, for various human institutions, and so on and so forth? Mm -hmm. Well, in the biblical text, Uh it mentions the Book of Life. Uh-huh. Your name being in the book of life. Right. Is this connected with the genome? Well, in my opinion, yes. Again, yeah. you, you know, um if if you are if you are looking at things from the scientific and technological point of view, every human genome is absolutely unique. Yes. Uh yours is is an absolutely irreducible, irrepeatable uniqueness. Uh, as is mine and anybody else listening to this show yeah. and that that genetic code spelled out with the letters that, that geneticists use to represent that code would be an absolutely unique name yeah. you know of billions of letters yeah. <laughs> but but nonetheless yeah and, and writing that name in the book of life <laughs> I think has um obvious genetic implications i i would also suggest and i'll leave this for people simply to ponder 
because I'm hoping to get to address this part of the topic in, in books I have planned down the line. But I'm also bold to suggest that that also has a cosmological meaning that is deeply, deeply tied to ancient views of the physical medium and how it creates information. Oh. So you're dealing, I think, here with a twofold, uh, a twofold metaphor of, of some very sophisticated thinking. Would a chimera be in this book of life? Yes, obviously, because again, if it's a, if the metaphor is genetic, yes, and if there, in turn there is a deep and profound connection between the information creating properties of, of genomes and the information creating properties of the physical medium itself. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. This is what so upsets me, George Ann, by those who are defending immoral actions on the basis of a system. Yes. Because in their system they're saying, okay, well, the the acts of of uh, this God or that God are perfectly justifiable in in defending the purity of some genome yeah. or some bloodline. But if they apply the same logic to you know things that were being said about black people in the 19th century or about Jewish people in the 20th century uh, as a means to slaughter in the name of the system, it's the same logic. Yes, it is. So you know this is why I I take the approach that. You know, I'm not approaching this whole topic from the standpoint of making any particular system the measure of all the others. I think that if you do that, it entangles you in, in massive moral implications that, that are not very savory. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's just be very blunt. So, you know, this, this is why I take that approach. Well, by golly, Joseph, this has been <laughs> very informative. Yeah, this is this has been <laughs> this has been another one of our wing it sessions. <laughs> yeah. What what was the argument between Inky and Enlil? Well, that that is a great one. Um, you know, we could probably do a whole series on that one. <laughs> We literally could, because in you know, let's just take the standard sort of mythological approach as a kind of a quasi-academic approach to that whole argument. Uh, Enlil, if you look at his character in those texts, he's kind of the uh, he's kind of the law and order guy. Um, yeah, he's he's sort of the. Uh, Joseph Stalin, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and Enki, on the other hand, if you look at his character, he's the only character that that I can compare him to in, in mythology that that, to my mind, works is is Loki in, in Norse mythology because they're both these uh, characters that seem to delight in upsetting the apple cart of the other gods. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they are, in other words, representatives in mythological terms of, of the forces of chaos. Yeah. So in, in mythological terms, you represent that argument as, as the old dialectic between uh, between order and chaos, out of which emerges, you know, the way that, that standard uh, interpretations tend to look at these sorts of things, out of which emerges the the diversity of the world, all right? Yeah. Uh, that's one way of viewing it. The other way of viewing it is taking the texts literally for what they say, that these are real people. And Enlil is, in these texts, the guy that simply wants to wipe out mankind, period. Yeah, he, doesn't, in, he doesn't like their noise. <laughs> he doesn't like their noise, exactly. You know, in, other words, in other words, you know, reading between the lines, you have a nice kind of uh, literary rhetorical device that's saying there's too many humans and they're a threat to our power. Yeah. All right. Enki, on the other hand, is is the person that, in those texts, is intimately involved in engineering mankind into existence to begin with. Yeah. And so he, therefore, is is the god within that pantheon that steps forward to 
save a certain segment of humanity in, in the Atrahasis epic, which is kind of their, you know, Mesopotamian Noah figure, yeah. uh, to save a segment of humanity that he himself tried to create. All right. So Enki is, is the one looked at a different way who is not going along with the decisions of the councils of the council of the gods so there's all sorts of ways i mean we could spend hours and hours and hours discussing these two characters because, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah we really could because mm-hmm. uh you know their characters alone are fascinating and their actions even more so but um, i take the view that you're looking with these two uh, characters in, in that pantheon that you're looking really at statements of, of deep-seated political agendas and that there yeah. may be an even deeper part of this story that, that we don't know yet. Um, so there's all sorts of ways to look at it. Mm. Well, <laughs> some of them want to extinguish us and others want us to uh, raise our consciousness and move along. Right, right. It's very interesting, Joseph. Yeah, it is. And in a certain sense, you could you could even look at Enki and Enlil as representatives of these two different competing elites and and the ideologies behind them. Yeah, very well put. Yes, I agree. Well, I'll let you off the hook for tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Everybody, you've been listening to Joseph P. Farrell, Dr. Farrell, and visit his website, GizaDeathStar.com. There is a PayPal button there. Please make use of it. And you can email Joseph at this address, Vardas, V-A-R-D-A-S, and then the number three, at AOL.com. And I want to thank you very much, Joseph. Well, thank you for having me back, George Ann. And and let me take the opportunity to to let people know that um, I do appreciate all of your support, your prayers, your your, those of you who have been good enough to sign up on the website and, and those of you who have continued with the donations because I am so deeply grateful. Um, and, and to you, George Ann, for having me on your show. I, I truly well, and genuinely appreciate it, and, and I hope that you'll you'll get some donations because I know that you struggle. There wouldn't be a show without donations, and um, well, yeah, there, there wouldn't be books without them either. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's very true. Joseph, several of your people uh-huh. have donated, and I want to thank them most particularly for their help. Um, it The bandwidth alone... Uh, is very expensive. Yes, yeah, yes it is. So thank you, everybody, for your help. And um, God bless everyone out there that's listening. My goodness. <laughs> this has been great, Joseph. And well, you're always, you. always welcome here. Well, thank you, Georgian. Good night, everybody. Good night.